An elite Navy diver goes on a day trip off the coast of New Zealand. But a lethal undercurrent drags him out into the ocean. I'm tumbling around, not knowing what's up or what's down. When he surfaces, he's all alone. What? There's nothing out there. Nothing but more water, more emptiness. His family assumes he's dead. When two police officers knock on my door, I can't explain what I was feeling. And in the depths of his despair, he'll wish he was. I just lay there, waiting for death to come. But to survive four days floating alone at sea, he'll have to battle exhaustion, hunger, and deadly predators. It's February, late summer on New Zealand's North Island. <clears throat> Naval officer Rob Hewitt is at a crossroads in his life. After 20 years in the Navy, Rob is about to become a civilian and is in search of a new career. As a 38-year-old man, I had a wife and children to look after. Rob. I wasn't too sure what I wanted to do. What is it that you're so scared of? Rangi, it's six o'clock in the morning and I'm late. I want an answer. Dying, Rangi. Losing you. Kids. That's what I'm scared of. I gotta go. Rob. The mood wasn't very good that morning when he left. Life changed for me uh, in a way that, that I wasn't quite ready for. After 20 years in the Navy, you get nine weeks leave, and you can go and decide what it is you want to try and achieve. Seeking a new direction in life, Rob hopes to use his Navy experience and become a professional diving instructor. Sorry, mate. I guess one of the things that, 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 uh, that I've been trained in was never be late. And what I, what I didn't want to show for my first dive for the, with the group of guys that I was with was that I didn't want to be late. After 20 years in the Navy, yeah, I, I was never late for anything. Let's go. And for the first time, he's joined a civilian dive team for a crayfish hunt around the coastal island of Mana. As the boat heads to its first anchor point, Rob eats a light breakfast and looks forward to what he thinks will be the simplest dive of his life. I had dived more places in the world than what I had in my own backyard. Here I was diving over in Singapore, Afghanistan, Australia. As I'm on the boat heading out towards our uh, first dive spot, I'm thinking it's a beautiful day. The water is clean and clear. This is too easy. The mood on the boat was one of excitement. There was some jovial laughing and jokes going on. Then the challenges start popping up. You know, how long can you stay under the water for? How big a crayfish can you get? Thought I'd better get in the water and, and show them how it's done.
for safety, the divers all swim in pairs. As Rob heads under the water with his diving buddy, he feels the familiar thrill of excitement. I remember growing up as a child, I used to watch that program Aquaman, man from Atlantis, and used to dream that was me. Once I hit the water, I feel like I'm at home. Once I hit the seabed bottom, I proceed to get myself in the hunting gathering mode. Sometimes when I'm under the water, I'd look under a rock or behind a rock, and I'd think to myself, has anyone else seen this? Has anything else um, passed over this bit of rock? Am I the first person in the history of this rock to, to actually touch it or to look at it? And that gives me a sense of strength. It also gives me a sense of achievement. I love a quietness. The only thing that I can hear is my heartbeat. Rob has spent years underwater, successfully locating bodies, mines, and enemy frogmen. But finding crayfish proves surprisingly difficult. So I'd spend 20 minutes under the water, and I'd come back with nothing. Last dive of the day, mate. Let's see if you can catch a crab this time. Yeah. And then this guy showed me his crayfish, and he just shoved it in my face and said, look at this. <laughs> and I'm just like any other bloke. It's a bit of a challenge. And I'm thinking, right. Yeah, the next dive, I was um, going to find the biggest crayfish that I can. But this time, as Rob and his dive buddy descend, there's a problem. Unable to clear the air from his ears, it's too painful for Rob's buddy to dive. I felt gutted. There were eight other divers under the water somewhere. Given his 20 years experience as a Navy diver, Rob decides there's only one option, to dive alone. This is it. I'm going to come back with a sack full of crayfish and just show these guys that I'm the king diver. Rob's injured pride has clouded his professional judgment. Scuba diving is one of the most dangerous pursuits in the world. If he gets into trouble this far underwater, without a buddy, then there'll be no one to raise the alarm. As I'm swimming through the kelp and I push it aside, I see some sea urchins or kinna, and my wife and I love this stuff. Urchins will make a good starter, but Rob's after the main course, crayfish. My instincts was to shoot off. Didn't care about the depth, I just shot straight after it. I start making my way through the kelp and the seaweed, looking around every nook and cranny. I quickly grabbed it and put it in my bag. Rob's pride is restored, but in his haste to catch the crayfish, he hasn't noticed a critical change in the water around him. I felt something different. A lot of cold water just ran over me. I turned and looked at the water and it was swirling all over the place. Suddenly Rob's hit by a powerful rip current. 
a narrow channel of fast-moving water that instantly drags him away from the dive site. I'm tumbling around, not knowing what's up or what's down. In the unstoppable current, Rob risks drowning by losing his breathing apparatus or smashing into an underwater boulder. I can feel myself getting deeper and deeper. And I remember thinking to myself, was this it? Was this death? As I'm tumbling around, getting disorientated, it could have been a matter of seconds, or it could have been two or three minutes. Time had no value. The current is sucking Rob deeper and deeper. If he hits a rock, he'll be knocked unconscious and drown. My ears are starting to pop, and I'm finding it hard to breathe. I grab the rock and I just push up. I kick as hard as I can, as fast as I can to get out of the rip. And the light was coming towards me. train of thought was that I'd only be around about 45, 50 metres on the stern of the boat. But then I turned around and I couldn't see where the boat was. I did a 360 degree turn and then I couldn't believe how far I was away from the dive boat. In a matter of minutes, the current has pushed Rob nearly a kilometre from the boat. A proud Maori man with years of training behind him, he decides to swim back to the boat. I don't want to be judged by my peers. Rob Hewitt, he was the guy that got rescued three days before he left the Navy. I've done a lot of swim training with my dive gear on. This was my second home. I would kick as long as I needed to kick, and I would get to where I needed to get to. But despite paddling hard, the boat doesn't seem to get any nearer. What? Ah. As I'm on the surface swimming towards the boat, Every now and again, I try and identify where the boat is. I can feel the current pushing me. I'm not making any headway. Dragged out into deep water, Rob is now in the grip of dangerous coastal currents that surge between New Zealand's North and South Islands. Help! Over here! Come over here, boss! I yelled out as, as loud as I could. They couldn't hear me. They couldn't see me. Help! <sighs> Rob's diving gear keeps him afloat, but it's impossible to swim to shore. The current continues to push him further out to sea. Rob's dive companions realise that there's a man lost and alert the Coast Guard. It seems like there's two to three, five boats all looking. They're all looking in the wrong place. Less than half a metre above the surface, Rob's outline is easily hidden by the swell and the rescuers have no idea he's being washed away by a current. I need to get rescued by anything or anyone just to get out of the water. But as minutes turn to hours, 
the coastal waters suck him away from the search area, away from land and into the deadly Tasman Sea. see this plane coming towards me. Oh, yes, yes! My heart picks up. Dad, here! Yeah! I think to myself that I can see the plane, the plane can see me. I'm going to be rescued. Dad, here! Yeah! Dad, here! Yeah! Come on, I'm dead here! Yeah! But the plane just keeps on going past me. I couldn't understand why they couldn't see me. From the air, Rob is just a speck in an unrelenting slab of grey. Please! Come back! As the plane flies away from me and it gets smaller and smaller, my heart drops. The rescue is dwindling. I find myself five miles from Mana Island and I know that I'm still getting pushed out. As the sun begins to set, Rob faces a daunting reality. The rescue planes won't be able to find him in the dark, but the sharks that live in these waters will. I look at the sunset. It's the most beautiful sunset that I've seen. It could be the last. I thought that I'd be rescued by now, but I still find myself out here. As the last light of day fades, Rob prepares himself for his first night in the ocean alone. He knows he will have to draw on all his diving experience if he is to make it till morning. This will be the sternest test he's ever faced. I don't know if I'm man enough to push through the night and survive. I don't know how to do that. I've completed night dives with my time in the Navy, but I don't know anyone that has survived out at night in the middle of nowhere. Meanwhile, Rob's wife, Rangi, finds out he's missing. When two police officers knock on your door, you think, geez, what is up? You know, something can't be good. From our conversation earlier that morning... What is it that you're so scared of? I had a feeling that he shouldn't have left. So it was very hard. Alone in the sea, Rob faces the greatest challenge of his life. Make it through the night alive and pray for rescue in the morning. To try and stay warm, Rob adopts the Navy's help position by folding his limbs in tight. But floating motionless, his body heat quickly drains away. Every little move I make, I can feel the cold water getting into places through an opening of my wetsuit, underneath the feet or in between the gloves and coming down my neck. Alone in the ocean, he's well aware of the threat from sharks, which hone in on weak and vulnerable prey. I just stayed there motionless. You could hear a pin drop. Every little wave, every little crack behind me. I was trying to slow my heartbeat down because I didn't want it to make noise or vibration in the water because it might alert the shark.
All I want to know is when the sun's coming up. Miraculously, after 18 hours alone, Rob is still alive, and his hopes of rescue soar. When I saw the sun, I thought to myself, right, this is it. You're going to get out of this one. But as the sun got to about 10 o'clock, I'd seen no rescue effort. The current has now taken Rob 16 kilometers from the original dive site. I found abandoned. It's been 20 hours since Rob was first swept out to sea. Alone and terrified, he's desperate to talk to someone or something. One of the things that I've been told about being out at sea was that loneliness was going to kill you. But Rob is not entirely alone. Looks like it's just you and me then, huh? I saw my crayfish that I'd caught. At this point in time, this crayfish was the closest friend that I had. I called him Tama. Even though I knew this was crazy land, you know, a, a crayfish can't talk back to me, but I'm having a conversation with this crayfish. So, buddy, what's your plans for the weekend? Huh? Swimming. <laughs> Swimming. After the calm, a southerly wind begins to lash the surf. The wind got stronger. The waves are pushing me from the left to the right, kicking me in the back and punching me in the front. My eyes are stinging, I can't see anything. And as I was wiping the water away from my face, uh, unbeknown to myself, I was actually cutting away at my face with the Kevlar gloves that I had on. 28 hours of constant soaking has left Rob's skin loose and vulnerable to bacteria and injury. I looked at my hand and it was translucent. The fingernails had started to come off. that I felt was unbelievable. The sea is slowly killing him, and there's nothing he can do. I started to vomit yellowy bile, the last ingredients in my stomach. Rob has had nothing to eat or drink since entering the water. I thought I'd hit rock bottom. I needed to try and figure out how to stop vomiting and to put something in my stomach. Rob's catch bag contains the seafood he caught yesterday, which could keep him alive. So I grabbed my knife and cracked open my first sea urchin. I feel my body just grabbing all of the sustenance and energy out of it. Cracked the second one open. I shove all of the guts and the row down my throat, eating and licking away at the shell. I looked into my bag. I saw Tama sitting there, still flapping, still alive. Naming and talking to the crayfish has eased Rob's crippling loneliness. But the time for sentiment is over. Sorry, Tama. Sorry, I tasted 
as if it was the first meal I'd ever had. The feast has bought Rob more time, but over 20 kilometers out to sea, his chances of being rescued are increasingly unlikely. And with no fresh water to drink, Rob knows he needs a miracle if he is to survive. And just before the sun went down, it started to rain. Down into my mouth, onto my swollen tongue, and opened up my mouth as wide as I could. The fresh water that landed on my tongue and around my lips was unbelievably great. I tried to grab and suck as much fresh water as I could. It gave me a sense of life. I, I had another chance. The crayfish meat and brief rain shower are just enough to pull Rob back from the brink and fire his will to survive. Back on land, Rob's wife Rangi feels drawn to the ocean that has swallowed him up. I walked out into the sea to be closer to Rob basically, and I just wanted to put myself out there with him somehow. Because I knew he was there somewhere, alive. Felt like a bit of a crazy woman at the time. Well, Rob was missing. But the water was really warm and it felt really Nice and calm. But I can't explain what I was feeling. For Rob, a second night alone in the sea now beckons. I see a light. It could be on the mainland. I'm unsure, but I still see a light. Rob has drifted so far north that he's within sight of another offshore island. Help! Kapiti. Help! It gives me a beacon of hope. It gives me a direction. This is my chance, my chance to save my life. It's the first time the inescapable coastal currents have pushed him close to land, and he's determined to swim for it. If I died out in the ocean, I wouldn't have watched my son play football or rugby. I wouldn't go to my daughter's birthday or, or even give her away at her wedding. As I got closer to the island, it seemed like a mile, a mile and a half away. I was close, I could nearly touch it, I could nearly smell it. But just when it seems Rob will make it back to land, his strength begins to fail. Each crawl I go forward, I can feel my bones, I can feel my body creaking. The cramp is starting to set in. The tide, once again, turns against him. Rob's tough naval training and stubborn will to survive are no longer enough. 
The wind and the waves were pushing me further and further out. The body just gave up, and I blacked out. I woke up further away. I realised then that my chance was over. It's the final straw. 40 hours after the nightmare began, the current is now dragging him back out to sea. There's nothing out there, nothing but more water, more emptiness. This is it. I'm spent, I'm gone. I tried everything. I'd swum as far as I could, ate what I could, drunk what I could. Now, I just lay there, waiting, waiting for death to come. I remember walking onto the beach. Going into a local shop. I grabbed a cold can and I could feel the cold blast just come out. Next thing I knew, <gasps> here I was back in the water. <sighs> Rob now faces a second night at sea. Throughout the night, I was thinking how I'd live my life. What ifs? What if I hadn't gone for an extra crayfish? What if I hadn't dived on my own? I was also thinking about my children and about my wife, about how I could ask for their forgiveness. Daybreak finally arrives, bringing with it new hope of rescue. Help! Help! Somebody help! Please. Please, God. But as Rob begins his third day alone in the ocean, he knows he is perilously weak. He removes his oxygen tank and buoyancy jacket. There's no air left in them. They are dead weight. His thick wetsuit still keeps him afloat. And with clear skies above, he feels a glimmer of hope returning. The weather on the third day was beautiful. It gave me hope that I'd be rescued. But Rob has been lulled into a false sense of security. I see a shape, something quick just poof, coming past. I don't know what type, but a shark's a shark. I grab my knife out. As I'm thrashing around in the water, I feel helpless. 
is it going to end like this? A shark finally coming up to have a feed. I just stayed there motionless. Two minutes was five minutes. The next minute was an hour. I was still there. As the day goes on, it isn't sharks that threaten his life. The bright sunshine that Rob thought would bring out more rescue teams is slowly cooking him alive. The sun was beating down throughout the whole day. I feel toasted. My face felt swollen. My tongue was swelling. I can feel that the skin is blistering. All of the cuts and the scars along my face were starting to bake. And the water, the salt water, was getting into the, into the cuts. <sighs> Here I was, thanking God for a, for a beautiful day. But this beautiful day would bring me pain. In normal conditions, the human body can go three days without water. But that's vastly reduced in the ocean. Having drunk only a few drops of rainwater, Rob is dying of dehydration. The relentless sun only makes it worse. There was only one place for me to hide and that was under the water. But every roll below the surface washes salt water into open sores. Hardly breathe. Please, God. He's seen no sign of rescue for three days. And if the sharks don't kill him, lack of water certainly will. He can either wait for a slow and agonizing death or take things into his own hands. I feel like I just had a gutful of the torture. I just felt like it was my time just to say goodbye to everyone and everything. Dear God, look after my family. Look after my family. Oh. Rangi. feel my heart beating as if it's beating out of my chest. I can just feel the thump, thump, thump in my head. Oxygen is wanting to get there, but, but I'm not allowing it to. I just wanted to kill myself. After three days of drifting miles out to sea with no sign of rescue, he decides to drown himself and bring his suffering to an end. But the sea isn't ready to let Rob go. I felt gutted. I couldn't even kill myself properly.
Rob now knows he's facing certain death alone and takes what comfort he can from thoughts of his loved ones. I tried to call out names of people that I loved just to give me some sort of connection. Casey. I love you, Sam. Rob has now drifted over 60 kilometers. Ironically, the ocean current that pushed him north switches and drives him back towards the dive site. But approaching a third night in the water, Rob is too weak to notice. I thought to myself, well, if I wake up in the morning, I'll wake up. If I don't, I'll be with my grandparents. On the mainland, rescuers think Rob must be dead. But his wife, Rangi, refuses to believe he's gone and calls to her Maori ancestors with an offering. I had my green stone, which one of my grandparents had given me, and tied it with my daughter's stone that Rob had given to her. While I was doing that, I was doing a calling out to my ancestors to return him back to us. I've given you these tonga of ours. Now give my tonga back to me. Rangi's prayers may be too late. After four days, with barely any fresh water, Rob's behavior becomes wildly irrational. I felt claustrophobic in my wetsuit. I had started to strip it off. I chucked my dive hood as if I'm in the garage, just tossing it on the table. The insulating layers of rubber are the only thing preventing him from dying of hypothermia. But he no longer cares. I then take off my dive fins and the dive fins are the last thing that any diver would take off because they're the things that are going to keep you up when you're kicking. <laughs> Nearly 75 hours since he first dived for crayfish, Rob is unaware that the ocean current has deposited him back where he started, near Manor Island and he's ditched all the gear that has kept him afloat and alive. I can feel the energy going quickly, the will to live disappearing and waiting for death to come. Okay. 
All I can see is a white fluffy cloud just sitting there. I was sad for my children, my family. No one would have known that I at least tried to stay alive for three days. I tried to stay alive for them. But all I'm worried about and concentrating on is that cloud. I hear this sound. And I see this thing in my periphery of vision. Is it the sound of death? The Maori gods have answered Rangi's prayers. He's got it. 75 hours after he was last seen, rescuers spot a dive hood floating near the original dive site. And close by, they finally find Rob Hewitt. I thought that this was all hallucination. And I remember seeing a friend of mine. Good job, mate. And just said, just keep your eyes on me. I'll just want to look at you. Rob was rushed to hospital, suffering from extreme hypothermia, chronic dehydration, sea lice, and sunburn. He'd lost nearly 10 kilos in weight. 14 months later, my wife and I had a daughter called Ohomarangi, which means the awakening. Rob finally retired from the Navy. He now works as a diving instructor in the very waters that so nearly took his life. I'm happy and I'm alive and that's what really counts.